Hey guys, Lou Perez here and welcome to the Lou Perez podcast. You might uh, recognize me from my work with We The Internet TV, uh, with Greg and Lou. And just so you know, this podcast is completely independent from those other projects. So I could really use your support. If you want to support me, head on over to locals.com and check out the Lou Perez community over there. That'd be great. Uh, this episode was a lot of fun. I got to bring together two friends of mine, Danny Savalos, who is a defense attorney and my longtime uh, writing and comedy partner and best friend and best man at my wedding, Greg Burke. And on the episode, we talk about my hard fought fight against the state. We talk about the shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and most importantly, with the announcement that the new Batman is going to be released sometime next year, we took that opportunity to talk to a defense attorney to ask him, you know, what would happen if people found out that Bruce Wayne was actually Batman? What kind of lawsuits would it be up against, you know, both civil and criminal? And uh, fortunate for us and fortunate for you, turns out Danny is a complete Batman nerd, as is Greg Burke. Hey guys, Lou Perez here with the Lou Perez Podcast, and I'm here with uh, Danny Savalas, who is an NBC News legal analyst. And I first met Danny uh, on the Live from America podcast with our friends uh, Hatem and Noam. Um, that's recorded right above the uh, the Comedy Cellar. Uh, so Danny, thank you so much for, for joining me. Lou, thank you so much for having me on your show, especially in light of the fact that in our first meeting, I believed you would probably never talk to me again. You know, you know, in life where you have that, you do something so embarrassing that it makes you want to jump off a cliff every time you think of it. <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about, Lou? I, I, I do. And I'm, I'm, you know, you could, you could tell yeah. everybody what, what it's about. So what yeah. happened? I met Lou and Lou was so nice to me. We're at this podcast. And just before, you know, I had just had a baby and Lou, Lou says to me, and, and you know, now of course, of course, I think I can say it, but Lou at the time had just found out that he and his wife were pregnant. And he warned me, he said, hey, we haven't told anyone yet, so don't say anything. And you know that thing when someone tells you not to do something and there's a part of your brain that can't help but do, oh God, I'm going to say it. Oh God, I'm going to say it. And sure enough, I made it all the way to the end of the show. And I turned to you and for some reason, come almost, I just blurted it out. And I don't even remember why. And I was utterly humiliated. And I, I uh, am still sorry to this day, Lou. And, and I do believe now uh, that you are telling folks that you are pregnant. Yeah, we're, we're t- um, we have to because we have the, uh, the product of it, uh, right, it of right. the pregnancy, <laughs> almost, almost six months. Um, right, it, right. It, it's so funny you bring that up because like, uh, there was a one thing where, where when you were coming on, I'm like, oh, man, I really hope he doesn't bring that up. And the reason why is it's like I'm, I'm OCD. And like I obsess about little unimportant things that have happened in my Me life, too. but some re- but some re- some reason it comes up, and I want you to know it is it has been water under the bridge, like oh great, right right from the right from the start and all that. So great. The, great, the idea that 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 you know. It, it's somehow torturing you in, 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 a, in the tiniest <laughs> well, way. It makes me feel makes me feel terrible. No, no, that. no, no. You get it though. You know, everyone does that. Like something that they did that's so embarrassing, and they if they if they're just walking down the street years later and it flashes into their head, they're like, God, dog, oh, damn. You know. And uh, yeah. but look, we had such a good time. That's why it mattered to me. And I, you know, I enjoy any time I get to see you at the cellar or otherwise. Right on, thank you. And I and I had a very awkward moment on the in the elevator uh, this uh, this morning. Uh, I I get in, and an uh, elderly uh, neighbor gets into the elevator as well. And I ask her which floor she's going to. She says five. And I I went and I touched the the button with my elbow, and then she started making fun of me for it. It was weird. Like <laughs> this 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 like eighty year old woman was taking the piss out of me because I didn't use my the my fingertip. And, and I'm like, uh, I was, I was put in a really bad position because, uh, she, she told me that I would, what I did was weird. And I told her, well, it could have been a lot weirder. You know, there's any number of things I could have done to just make this whole situation weirder. So now that's going to play in my head throughout, uh, for the, you know, for the next few days, like, like, man, should I have, should I, was I bitchy to that old lady who like made fun of me? Should I have been bitchier? You know? 
So it's, uh, Lou, it's a- aren't you envious of the people that you know that don't ever think this stuff? I'm so envious of people that just go through it. They wouldn't think about that for a second. They just move on to the next thing. I, I really, I, I want that. Yeah, there's like a, you know, and I know there's a spectrum, but it's like now imagine being like a psychopath where you're like, you don't, <laughs> right. you right. don't, you don't care, care about anything. anything. <laughs> yeah, you have bodies, you know, buried and you don't, and you don't care about. So if I could just have, if we could find that happy medium, um, yes. that would be, that would be really, uh, really good for us. Um, of course. And so, so for, for, for people who aren't, aren't familiar with your work, you are a, a defense attorney. And I think you'll be proud to hear that, uh, I did a little bit of my own defending in that I disputed a parking ticket online. Hey. Yeah, and I won. I beat the city. I beat the state, man. It was I was you know one man up against the machine, and I went and I did it, and um, and I and I made it happen. So I saved uh, sixty bucks. I think I you know probably doesn't add up with all the hours of uh, right research and all that I had to do, but I saved sixty bucks. And then the other day I turn around and get a parking ticket for 110 bucks that I have to pay because I really can't uh, right. fight that one because I deserve, I deserve that one. But for that moment, I was my own defense attorney. You were, uh, you know, you, you are what we call a pro se litigant, which means, you know, it's someone who represents themselves and they have been called both the bane and the glory of the legal system. And they really are. I mean, anytime I see a pro se litigant in court, I am sticking around even if my case is over because I want to see what's going on. But, you know, the idea was that our courts were supposed to be open to the people. And, and I don't think that modern courts reflect that idea. I mean, yes, lawyers who are familiar with the system make it run more efficiently. But really, the system also punishes people, especially in the world of park tickets and speeding tickets, one of the things you find is that from the minute you walk in, if you're disputing a speeding ticket or something else, the system immediately gives you one of two paths. The shortest, easiest, quickest path is pleading guilty and the long wait in this line, you'll be the last person called line uh, and your case won't be heard for several months. That's the path to vindicating your rights. And, you know, I don't know that that's, I mean, I get that courts are overwhelmed, but at the same time, I don't think that's what was envisioned with the idea of a pro se plaintiff. But, you know, also at the same time, pro se plaintiffs can be pretty entertaining because they come up with some pretty creative arguments. Yeah. You know, on, on the, uh, on the note of, uh, you know, just sort of the whole process. Um, so there's an app, uh, a website called next door, the next door app. And I go on, uh, I go on it and, you know, I, I write really good reviews about restaurants. And then I also posted uh, when I got my ticket uh, basically telling everybody in the neighborhood, be on the lookout because they're they're hunting, man. They're hunting and they're giving tickets, even tickets they shouldn't be giving. And one of the people who helped me actually put together the argument that I, that I ended up submitting, she, uh, you know, the same thing happened to her, but she's been uh, waiting and waiting to do an in-court appearance. So here we right. have a situation where, in my case, I submitted my argument online and it was it was dropped. And now you have another case um, where the woman had the same exact argument, but yet now it, it's being dragged out and dragged out. And you wonder, like, how is there any way to make sure that 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 doesn't actually happen? That there is, you know, even, uh, you know, on that level of like a traffic ticket or a parking ticket, uh, you know, equality before the law. Yeah, I don't think it's I don't think it's ever going to be possible for because. You have just so many litigants, and especially when you get to the level of parking tickets and speeding tickets, which are really interesting because they they occupy a unique space in that they are the, and I use air quotes, crime uh, or infraction that the vast majority of citizens will deal with is parking tickets, speeding tickets, and they really don't operate anything like the rest of the criminal justice system. First of all, if parking tickets and speeding tickets are what we call uh, strict liability crimes. They are, uh, you know, uh, wrongs that the, the state doesn't care whether you intended them or not. There is no intent requirement. Anyone who drives knew this from the day they got their license. If you get pulled over and you're doing 90 and a 55, the police officer isn't going to determine whether or not to write you a ticket based on your reasoning for driving. I mean, yeah, if you're rushing someone to the hospital, maybe, but or, or whether or not, you know, if you, you say, hey, I had no idea I was going that fast, 
it's not a defense. It's never been a defense to a crime, at least a strict liability crime. Whereas anything above that, anything above fishing without a license or speeding, it's the government's burden to prove that you intended the outcome of your conduct. So it's uh, it, th- those those cases occupy a, an interesting place. The other reason there there will never be uniformity, and to many, uniformity may be the closest thing that we can get to fairness in the justice system. But the reality is no two cases are alike and no two mm-hmm. cases are processed alike. A case processed in New York County is going to be a lot different than a case processed in Putnam County, uh, simply because these are all separate sovereigns, so to speak. They're all separate courthouses that run things differently. And any lawyer will tell you, I mean, practicing in Manhattan is a lot different than just practicing across the bridge in, in Brooklyn and certainly a lot different than Staten Island. So you mm-hmm. can imagine once you're talking about different states, uh, how confusing it can get. And I happen to practice in a, in a few different states. And I got to tell you, that that is one of the most challenging things is keeping all these procedures straight. And so with all of this to navigate, it's no wonder that that folks, you know, regular citizens really find the court process so daunting. Yeah. And I, I some years back, I got a, uh, a speeding ticket in Arizona. And I think I I think I was like almost criminally above the speed limit or something like that. Right. I think I was, I think I was doing, uh, allegedly doing something like, uh, 96 in like a 70 or something or, or in a 96 in like a 65 or something like that. And I wasn't a resident of Arizona. I was driving from Arizona back to California where I was living at the time. And the prospect of, you know, anytime I hear criminal, I mean, obviously that that's going to, you know, really put the, uh, uh, put the fear in you. And uh, fortunately, I was able to find uh, a, you know, local uh, attorney uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to plead my case. And I remember when we were putting like things together, one, you know, pu- putting uh, the account of what happened and uh, why was I, you know, traveling that fast? Was I aware? Uh, one of the arguments was, and I actually I wasn't aware that I was going that fast. It was a rental car. And I had been used to driving a smart car. That was my uh, my normal car that I had in California. Sure. So this, sure. so this rental car was like a real car. In in a smart car, if I was going over seventy, the thing would shake like crazy. Oh but wow! Rent, but in this rental car, it was able to handle uh, that speed on a very smooth, you know, just straight run of of highway without me being uh, without me noticing it. But but then I but then another thing was I I started like kind of putting together you know these. Um, uh, uh, you know, basically not, not like letters of recommendation, but people who could like vouch for my character and, it, and sure. it's almost like, and it's letters. almost like, yeah, yeah char- character letters. And it's almost like, man, if I didn't have that, you know, like I would definitely not be treated the same way. I think like if I didn't have a boss who was willing to be, Hey, no, I'll lose a good guy or, you know, be able to say, Hey, I've done charity work. Um, so that, that's something I, I, you know, just think about as far as, you know, uh, the law looking the same, um, you know, treating people the the same if they don't if they don't have uh, the same you know biography of the same past as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, character is an interesting concept. Most of the time, it's not admissible, but it comes up for criminal defense attorneys in the context of sentencing. So. Mm-hmm. Once someone's been convicted and they're before the court to be sentenced, what you find a lot of the time is that you know, well-heeled defendants have no, no end of influential people who will write letters for them or on their behalf. And it creates a total picture that is markedly better than your run-of-the-mill indigent, indigent client who uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't have a lot of influence in the world. And it's interesting that we allow that kind of evidence in and, you know, When it comes to sentencing, I do believe you should be able to put anything that helps your client forward. But at the same time, there are some folks who just don't have access to a a letter from a, you know, from a, uh, uh, I don't know, a a mayor or a police chief in another county or something like that. So it's, uh, you know, character is an interesting concept in the law. Most of the time, not allowed, but it is, there are exceptions when it does come in. Cool. Uh, so, Danny, we're going to be joined by uh, my buddy, Greg Burke. Uh, he's joining us right now. Hey, Greg, are you there? I'm here, yeah. Hey, Greg, so I want you to meet uh, Danny. He's, uh, he's on the line. We've been talking uh, for a little bit. Uh, so, Greg is uh, my longtime uh, comedy partner, uh, best friend, I would say. He was, my, he was the best man at my wedding, so this is very special. Um, and now, now, now we're going to talk about a lot of weird, um, 
you know, very troubling stuff, uh, if you will. What an introduction. Good to be here. <laughs> yeah, Greg. Well, Greg, nice to meet you. But now, you know, there's a, there's a real issue in the air. Would you reciprocate and say on the record that you are Lou's, Lou is your best friend as well? I, I guess I'd have to, right? He's put me on the spot and I was his best man. It's very so I awkward. I have to say, yeah. Was he your best man or will he be your best man? <sighs> That's a great question. I guess you'll have to wait. <laughs> you'll have to wait and tune into my podcast when I welcome Lou onto my show. Well, I, right. I, I want to. I, we'll I want to do everything I can to make sure that he doesn't get married, so that he's he's just there for me. I'm very selfish with my best friends. I want them all to myself. Oh, <laughs> so, um, but uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, hey, real uh, quick, uh, Danny, while, while we, it's awkward, oh. Daniel, can I ask you? Uh, has anyone ever said to you that your name sounds like Telly Savalas? Yes, but you know we are part of a uh, a dying generation because when I was growing up, every single coach and teacher, mostly coaches, that I had in any sport, my name was Telly. My name was Telly, probably well into the early to mid two thousands. Wait, but now of that? ask a millennial. Oh yeah, it was always called <laughs> Telly, and now ask a millennial. Oh yeah, because you got to remember in the mid, you know, any all the way up to maybe. 2000 there most adults grew up on kojak sure, yeah. for those folks listening who have no idea who telly savalas is you're not alone anyone under 40 you know generally i find doesn't doesn't know who telly savalas is he was an actor uh with a shaved head actor of i think Greek shaved descent, head actor. Who, <laughs> yeah well i mean he had a big you no, know, that's bald, how that's how his head. agent pitched him <laughs> right, right. That he wasn't. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, uh, make assumptions. Uh, he's no longer with us. But he uh, he was a pretty famous actor for appearing in American Ex or no Diners Club, which was the predecessor to Credit Cards, and then also uh, in a TV show called Kojak. So because he was still fresh in everyone's mind when I was a kid, my nickname was Telly all my life. Wow. Uh, until now, now you, you'll never find anyone calling me Telly now because no one remembers uh, Telly Savalas. Dad, I, I find it would be amazing if, if actually the real reason why everyone called you Telly was because you knew so much about Telly Savalas. <laughs> <laughs> You're like the original Wikipedia entry for Telly Savalas. Who loves you, baby? Loves you, baby. <laughs> yeah, I think Lou and I are probably right on the edge of people who know about Telly Savalas. And I forget, yeah. well, I yeah. Lou, I forget why we started talking about him, but there was a moment where like he was very fresh in our minds because of. Who loves you, baby? I, th I think uh, Jim Carrey did a great impression of him on in Living Color in uh, in like a commercial, and we we were watching old sketches. Oh, is that what it was from? Cool. Okay, it right. might have been. Well, yeah, I think I think comics in general, uh, I find, are more historians of pop culture yes. than regular folks. Definitely. I don't know. I think you would agree with that, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's been my experience. But your you know, regular person on the street uh, who doesn't consume pop culture, they probably haven't heard of telly. So. Uh, so, uh, uh, Danny, what, one thing I, want, I wanted to ask you is, you know, you are a defense attorney and I'm wondering, uh, how did you go about deciding to be a defense attorney? Because I think a lot of people, uh, when they think of a lawyer, they think, um, you know, in their mind, they you know, sort of courtroom dramas come come to mind. But the reality is, like most lawyers never even do anything in court. Uh, it's, you know, mostly a contract law and, and, and stuff like that. How did you, how did you get to uh, uh, where you are today? Yeah, you're very right about that, Lou. I mean, I started out at a large law firm here uh, uh, doing intellectual property of all things, which is like patents, copyrights, and trademarks. And I was nowhere near a courtroom, maybe a deposition here and there. But um, I didn't have any uh, thoughts of being a criminal defense attorney until a few years later, I decided to go out on my own and start my own practice. And and frankly, you know, when you're out on your own and there aren't checks coming in, you'll try anything. And so I decided I'd always wanted, had an interest in criminal defense. And I started uh, taking on cases. And uh, it's pretty scary. Criminal defense attorneys are in court a ton. And I had been in court not at all. So I was a big sweaty mess for the first couple of years. And uh, it was scary stuff. And the other thing that can be a real bummer about it is that, you know, these are people's, at the end of some of these cases, the, the deputies come out and take your client into a, a door in the wall and you don't see them anymore because they, they go to jail or prison. And so it can be pretty harrowing. Uh, but, you know, in many ways, it can be entertaining. It's a hang. It's kind of like, you know, comedians hanging out waiting for their spot. You know, everybody's waiting around for court to start. Yeah, it's a very social 
uh, a very social business. You, you get to know the DAs, you get to know the cops. And uh, there are ways that it's a lot of fun, but there are ways that it's a grind too. So that's how I, I started out uh, doing it. And then I just uh, took on more and more cases. And then uh, that's, that's how I arrived at it. But I really enjoyed the, for the same reason I like doing TV, I enjoyed the terror that I had you know, before court and uh, getting ready for it. I mean, it's the same kind of performance adrenaline drug that I think probably comedians uh, uh, get too, although I think you probably get it in a more extreme dose by performing. But uh, I, think, I think lawyers and comics have, uh, have always had a lot in common in terms of you know, performance and otherwise. Well, I, th- I think it seems like recently one of the ways that, that lawyers and comics have something in common, it, it's sort of the, um, uh, it, it's sort of the, the court of public opinion where sure. uh, I've seen I've seen quite a few uh, you know defense attorneys. It's either um, you know they're doing the noble thing and 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 defending this uh, this person who has the whole you know power of the state you know uh, raining down on them, or they're oh uh, this defense attorney is going to go and try to get this monster off of right. uh, off off of this charge. And it's um, and I think <laughs> wait I'm trying to say how it's similar to, to comedians like. Uh, in a, in a, I guess in a, you know, the court of public opinion, it's like, you know, that, how can you allow that monster to tell jokes or that good person sure. is telling jokes now? No, I know what you mean. Yeah, I, I definitely know because, you know, there's a, especially in the last couple of years, there have been folks that have been, uh, you know, comics, especially who have been, I guess, socially blackballed. And uh, they go from, you know, from hero to pariah very quickly. I mean, I covered the Bill Cosby case. Here's somebody that, that I think you'd probably have a hard time finding any of his, uh, his old DVDs from the 80s now. Uh, because, you know, that's somebody that, that, that his, his product is no longer popular because of, you know, what he did personally. But no, I, and, and for lawyers, you know, we, we do, I, it's an interesting thing because what I find is a lot of folks who have had no contact with the criminal justice system might have a dim view of criminal defense attorneys. And then they have their first contact and they feel like it's very unfair. And then all of a sudden, maybe they, they're more fond of criminal defense attorneys than they used to be. But, you know, I, I, I'm someone who at the same time, you know, I, I have grown to think that the, the system can be somewhat unfair. I think it's better than any other system in the world, uh, but it obviously has its problems, most notably that, you know, courthouses don't have, you know, are, are, are jam-packed full of cases. Uh, it's mass justice and mass justice is never really justice. It's not about the DA. The DAs aren't bad people. They're good people. The defense attorneys are, are not bad people either. You know, everyone's just trying to do their best, but it's a system that's just, you know, designed to be overwhelmed and doesn't run efficiently. But yeah, you know, defense attorneys get a bad rap and sometimes they get a, a, a great rap, probably like a lot of other uh, jobs. Yeah, it, and obviously, what, what's been happening, um, you know, definitely ever since uh, the George, the killing of, of George Floyd, uh, the you know civil unrest, the protests, as well as you know riots and violence, and that are that are taking over, uh, a lot of people, you know, are pointing to the very justice system as the reason why these things are, are happening. You know, obviously, you hear things like "no justice, uh, no peace," um, and well, what what impact do you think? that's going to have on the way things go in the, in the future. Yeah. You know, I've thought so much about this, both in commenting on these cases for NBC and, you know, because a lot of my clients are minorities, especially uh, some of my, you know, for a long time, I took what are called court appointed cases where you, they if a client or if a uh, a person is what they call indigent, they don't have money for an attorney the court will pay a private attorney. And in the beginning of my career, I took a lot of those cases. And it's mostly people without you know, a, a, a dollar to their name, uh, a lot of minorities, a lot of, you know, a lot of white folks, a lot of everything, a, a big spectrum. And uh, it, yeah, I mean, look, the system is much harsher to people without resources, like many other systems, like healthcare systems and other systems where, or even schooling systems. I mean, many of our systems are, uh, show preferential treatment to maybe not intentional, but people who have more money do better in places like schools, hospitals, and then of course in the criminal justice system. And so, you know, that is that is a challenge. I think you know, when I think of, do I think there's discrimination in the criminal justice system? I do, but not for the reasons you might expect. I think you see discrimination. It really is based on poverty. I think that 
you know, one of the things police do when they are looking at a car to pull over, they're, they're, they're not looking for the brand new, you know, minivan that it looks like it has a, you know, a, a car seat in it. They're looking for a junker. Irrespective of race, they're looking for a car that they know they can write up a couple tickets. And once they get to ticket land, they're only one step away from looking in the trunk or in the back of the car. And then they score points on their pinball game of, you know, how big of an arrest can you make? And if you're really lucky, you might get a kilo of cocaine in the back. You know, it's a game. It's it's cops and robbers. It's a it's a hunting game. And so, uh, yeah, I do think. You know, it's a system where people with less money do have less favorable outcomes, but I don't think that makes it that different than other systems. So, uh, and you mentioned George Floyd, and you know, it's interesting as we are record or doing this show, you know, the the defense. You know, a few months ago, the, the prosecution always gets the first crack at the narrative. You know, they announce charges and. Boy, you know, you saw that video of uh, Officer Shalvin with his knee on the neck. And, you know, the other, it does not seem like a defensible case. But now you're hearing reports that if they can garner enough autopsies on the defense side to show that the, uh, the knee on the neck did not cause the death. Wow. You know, now you have a case that from you, you had what seemed like irrefutable video evidence of a slam dunk first. Well, not, not first degree murder, but a slam dunk murder case. And now maybe they have a real defense. It's crazy. I mean, you know, one of the things I find that maybe makes me a bad lawyer is I can be easily persuaded, you know, the, the arguments on both sides. I really, you know, I, I, if, if they have an autopsy that persuades a jury that the knee on the neck was very bad, but it did not cause the death. I mean, it would shock the country if Officer Chauvin gets a not guilty. Yeah, I've been uh, reading a lot about people's concerns about what uh, what the charges will be. And, and you know, you're talking about, um, you know, uh, what's first degree, second degree, uh, right. manslaughter and, and all that and and how big of a role that will play in, you know, seeking out justice. Because I think for a lot of people, it's not necessarily, you know, no justice, no no peace. It's for some people, it's no revenge, no peace. And they want to, you know, enact this revenge and punish this person but you know you do have this buffer, which is the the law system, uh, in, you know, coming uh, uh, in between. So I, I wonder what you know what what effect that's going to have, and especially if you know uh, if if the charges if uh, uh, the charges are so heavy that the officers beat them, you know, beat the charges. Right. What right. you know what effect that's going to have on on the people who all already taking taking to the streets. Yeah, I, I, I frankly was very surprised that the other officers were charged. I wonder if that was just a, a, a tactic to get them to turn on Chauvin. But uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. But that's a you know, charging decision that I, I really, yeah, as a defense attorney, I'm probably biased. But uh, but yeah, I mean, the and even the charges themselves against Chauvin are, are pretty complicated because they're a form of murder. But a lot of folks don't realize that there are kinds of murder, depending on what state you're in that don't require an intentional killing. Uh, sometimes a, a highly reckless murder where you just did something really dangerous can be murder. And sometimes if you commit a felony and somebody dies during it, the classic example would be, you know, you rob a bank, a teller gets shot by your crazy partner. You know, the partner, the one that joined the team at the last minute and, uh, you know, nobody vouched for him. You know, the, the partner in the bank robbery that, that nobody trusted, you know, like the reservoir dogs example. And, uh, and, you can, all the defendants can be held liable for a killing that nobody intended. Uh, that's felony murder. So in the commission of a felony, and the argument there is Chauvin was committing a felony when he assaulted uh, uh, George Floyd, and therefore he can be tried for murder. So it's uh, we have a very interesting set of murder statutes in the United States where it doesn't always have to be intentional. And 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 what, what role or, you know, what impact, uh, or what role does, you know, uh, him being a policeman play because I think one huge. Uh, yeah. Cause, cause one, one, I think, a, I think a big problem that a lot of people have is when it comes to, uh, you know, police brutality, police abuse, um, they don't seem to be, uh, you know, treated the same way as if a regular citizen were to, or were in that situation. And, um, I don't have like the numbers or, or the stats, but I just know that a lot of people, uh, sort of see like, Oh, it's a cop. Cops are never charged or cops get off or, or, or that sort of thing is—is is there, uh, you know, what, what's behind that? Is—is is, uh, 
We have a really, yeah, we have a really unique system in that police are different from regular citizens in that they are legally authorized to lay their hands on people where other folks are not. Uh, and once that happens, then once they have the power to arrest and they choose to execute it, then there is an escalation of force that happens that they are allowed to use as much force as is reasonably necessary to effectuate an arrest. And you know, what's really fascinating is we're living in a time. We are living in a time. That force, that I use of force I, is being challenged. Okay. But yeah, we, Daniel, oh, Danny, we, we, we lost you for just a second on that. Okay. Yeah, we're, you know, we're living in a time now where, where people are reevaluating, you know, to what degree police should be using force to effectuate arrests. And it's really an interesting period because it wasn't just three or four years ago that the idea of, you know, police using force was absolute. Hey, once the decision to arrest is made, police are going to arrest you. And if they escalate force, then that's just the way it's going to be. And it's amazing to see that, that those conventional norms being challenged uh, in the modern day. It's no longer an assumption that everything should result in a, an arrest. I mean, that's, that's what it seems now. And it's, it's a really fascinating time. You know, again, not all arrests are an example of police brutality because police are allowed to arrest people. That's a, that's a privilege or a, a special power they have that other people don't. So for that reason, you know, that police are in a special place. The other reason that they're often not charged is the reality is prosecutors hate losing. So they know that juries really tend to give police the benefit of the doubt because the defense is going to get up there and they're going to talk about, hey, this person goes out every night and risks their life to protect you. And are you really going to convict him for uh, a, you know, a, 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 you know, a judgment he had to make in a split second? Sure. It's easy for us to think about this now in this air-conditioned courthouse you know, with, the, with all the time to think and deliberate on it. But that's not what police do. They have to make snap decisions and they're trained. His training is that anything, any furtive movement, any, anything at all is a weapon and anything can kill you at any time. You know, you think with, with all of that as a backdrop, it's no wonder we have our police you know, so, so jumpy. I mean, we train them that they're about to be killed any time. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, you know, stuff that we've been seeing, like, for example, in, in Kenosha, uh, I guess one might be able to call it like vigilantism, uh, where... Uh, it seems like some police forces have sort of backed off and uh, uh, people have been allowed to riot or to burn things down. And then other citizens are sort of taking it upon themselves to uh, to go in there and uh, restore order, if you will, or to protect uh, property. Um, so the, I guess the recent example is the 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse, um, who, uh, whoa, sorry, excuse me. Uh, my phone just went off. Um, th this guy, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, who he's been charged with two counts of first degree homicide and one count of attempted homicide. And, right. um, just wondering if you're familiar with that case and, oh know, yeah. um, and what, 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 you know, what, uh, if you were the, the, the defense, uh, on that, you know, what sort of, uh, what are, what are you doing? <laughs> Do you know, the, the amazing thing, Lou, is that with the advent of cell phones, you know, for the last it, for, for many years before there were phone, our cameras on every cell phone, we all said to ourselves, boy, you know, it sure would be helpful if there was video of the, uh, the incident. And now mm -hmm. there's video of every incident and we're still, still not uniform. You know, we, people look at the same video and get completely different things from it. I mean, it's amazing to me because, you know, I've, I, in my career, I've, I've seen cases go from, you know, no video evidence whatsoever to tons of video, tons of cell phone evidence and all this stuff that comes in. And, you know, almost every DUI now, car stopped, is almost completely high def audio, everything. It's totally changed everything. But what you find is you can still debate. Uh, reasonable minds can differ as to something that's right there in color on a video in front of your face. Mm -hmm. And so what you find with this, the, the biggest thing about the Kyle Rittenhouse situation is that we don't have video of what happened just before uh, the shooting that we do have on video. And I think that's, that's very important. But one of the other fascinating things is you saw two very distinct dialogues emerge from the exact same video footage. On one hand, you have folks saying, hey, you know, these people were trying to disarm this crazy person running around and shooting a gun. Uh, and then, of course, from the Kyle Rittenhouse side of the equation, you have guy who's a, you know, an EMT trying to help people and, you know, lawfully carrying, uh, open carrying a firearm. 
uh, and was attacked and using force commensurate with the force that was being levied against him. I mean, I think probably the best example is the uh, person who was shot in the arm but survived. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the facts are, yes, he was approaching him. Yes, he apparently had his hands up, but he also had a handgun. Yeah, he had so a gun. you see, you see, a, you see two totally different versions emerge, which is here's a guy approaching him, essentially surrendering, and then you have another version, which is he's approaching him with a handgun. And so what you have is two totally, totally different ways uh, of interpreting the same facts. And I think that's that's just a, a fascinating world that that we live in. That you know, we thought video would resolve so much, but maybe it isn't. Maybe it hasn't resolved anything. One thing I think that video has been great because it does give us a lot more objectivity, but, and it also brings cases to light that might never see the light of day. I mean, without videos in a lot of these cases, probably the, the most famous example is Rodney King. I don't think Rodney King would have, would have resulted in anything without video. Hey, Danny, real quick. Um, one of the things that came up when people were talking about that is the fact that uh, that kid crossed state lines with a gun. Um, yeah. How does that factor in as far as anything he does after that point? Well, the, the, there are a couple different problems with him crossing state lines with a, with a gun. One is that it, it creates a federal nexus for the federal government to get involved. Uh, the other thing is that uh, it's, it, it is in itself a crime. Right. So there are a couple different problems. You know, it just, it just adds up to more criminality and more opportunity to charge him. Uh, but, you know, his, his attorney originally argued that he would assert what's called a militia defense based on a clause in the Constitution, or I'm sorry, the Second Amendment to the Constitution, I don't know that that's going to be uh, successful. It hasn't been in the past, but the, the idea being that, that, hey, he's underage, uh, and yes, he possessed a firearm. As an, uh, if he possessed a firearm as an underage person, he still constitutionally should be allowed to have carried it because at 17, uh, in the colonial era, 17-year-olds uh, carried firearms. I don't think that's going to be an effective defense, but yeah, crossing state lines is usually, it, generally speaking, the federal government uh, is, uh, is a limited uh, government when it comes to prosecution. One of the ways they create a nexus for prosecution is take a normal everyday crime that would be a state crime, and then if it crosses state lines, then there becomes a federal nexus under what's called the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which you know allows the federal government to regulate commerce. So the same thing that you do in trust state within a state could be a state crime. The minute you cross state lines, yet anything from transporting a woman across state state lines for immoral purposes, which is an actual federal law, is that the man uh, act? can potentially. That's right. Exactly. It's the Man Act. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but very good, Lou. <laughs> uh, but the. Um, I know all but, about uh, those good rules, job, man. Dude, you know about I got, I got, yeah. He's very familiar. Getting very women familiar across state lines. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. I mean, any, any, uh, any time. If you remember from the movie The Firm, you know, as soon as you put a stamp on this uh, normally state crime and put it in an envelope and sent it, it became mail fraud. It became a federal offense. So, well, what you find is the federal government can expand its criminal jurisdiction pretty broadly, even outside the country. Uh, using uh, using its broad authority, including the Commerce Clause, is uh, is, well, the, um, is crossing uh, women across state line for I don't, know, I don't know if you said nefarious purpose immoral but, immoral, immoral. immoral. Uh, is that also how they got the uh, the nexium that cult? I don't know, but I I think it's how they got the the famous boxer Jack Johnson. I'm pretty sure. Jack oh. Johnson, a, a heavyweight from probably the uh, 19-teens, uh, was, uh, I believe he was arrested under the Mann Act, which, as you can imagine by the language, the immoral purposes, it's a pretty old statute. You can tell the age of some of these laws by the old-timey language that right. they use. Yeah, and, and I think that they definitely, uh, I think they use the fact that, you know, Jack Johnson was a, was a, a black man, and um, I believe his wife uh, at the time was a, was a white woman. Um, That's right. So it was, it was a way for them to, you know, definitely punish him for that. Um, yeah. So, so while we have like um, uh, only, uh, you know, a limited amount of time with you, I thought we, were, we should get into the really important stuff. Yeah. So um, with the new Batman movie uh, yes. set for re release next year, I was thinking, you know, what kind of lawsuits would be filed if people, people ever found out that Bruce Wayne is Batman? 
Like, well, right. So first of all, I mean, Bruce Wayne would be subjected to some massive civil liability because now you have, you know, before you had this shadowy figure uh, who has no name, no address, no nothing to sue. And once you find it, what we call a deep pocket, like Bruce Wayne behind uh, behind it, even these these criminals who have been who have been beaten up by him, and in my opinion, rightly so, are going to have all kinds of lawsuits uh, against Bruce Wayne. And Greg, I, you know, I don't know if Lou told you, I am I am by my own reckoning, uh, one of the premier uh, DC and uh, DC Comics experts with a, with a smattering of Batman uh, specialty. But I understand that you are a true Batman specialist. Uh, I mean, I'm a lover of comics. I was out of it for a while, but I recently got back into it. Um, what, what is your... What is your specialty in DC? If it's not that <laughs> my area, my area of expertise is probably you know nineteen eighties uh, uh, Green Lantern and oh, okay. uh, and Batman. Uh, you know the some of the Norm Bray Fogel art I like, but I, I uh, yeah I'm look I I just got the DC Comics app. I don't know if you've gotten that, Greg, but holy cow! Goodbye, eleven or twelve hours at a stretch. Oh I yeah, mean, I know. it's amazing. Yeah, you excited it's about amazing. the Green Lantern show? It's coming out on HBO Max. Uh, I am, I, I, but I was so traumatized by the film with Ryan Reynolds oh, that terrible, I, yeah. I just don't have a great deal of, uh, you know, that was the one I've been waiting for all my life. And that was a big letdown yeah. for me. So I, I was pretty bummed out. But, you know, Lou, it's interesting. When you told me, uh, when we were talking about DC uh, Comics before we started the show, I know probably of the three of us, you're the least uh, well-versed I, I in the Lou, have you uh, ever read an actual comic? comic? Well, I just wanted to look, if I ever have to hire Danny, you know, to be uh, my attorney, I want him to talk about Green Lantern in the closing <laughs> argument. That's right. That's just find right. some way to bring it up. <laughs> I got to crowbar that in. But, you know, it's funny. We talk about, you know, Batman and vigilanteism. You know, one of the things, Batman would actually be a pretty annoying person to police because, you know, it's one thing if he's picking up Two-Face or the Joker, those guys probably already have 50 outstanding warrants. But, you know, one of the things police do is they have to come into court and testify and put evidence in. So when he just ties somebody, ties a criminal up and leaves him on a lamppost with a note, you know, that he's not coming into court to testify and put these guys away. So I can see a lot of law enforcement. That, that's never really been brought up in the comics because it's not sexy. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's a real problem. Right. Has I there mean, ever been a real issue with vigilantes? Of, of anyone testifying with a mask on? Right. I mean, you have to be, uh, be able to identify the, the witness. I mean, the witness can't be anonymous. Witness, you have a constitutional right to confront your witnesses. Right. They, they can't come in you know, with a, with a, a Spider-Man mask and, uh, and, you know, be completely unrecognizable. Greg, did you have a follow-up for that? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I agree. <laughs> and the other problem is, like, identifying Bruce Wayne as Batman. I don't know how, in this sort of, like, you know, question that you've set up, Lou, I don't know how it exactly happens, because mm -hmm. anyone could essentially just dress up as Batman while you also have Bruce Wayne there, and then he could be like, well, no, that's, I'm not Batman, Batman's right there. Oh, oh he's right. The, he's the Tony Clifton to I'm Andy right. Kaufman? <laughs> yeah, or even like, like Martian Manhunter, who I'm sure you've never heard of before, Lou. <laughs> no, never. I thought you actually made that Martian up. Martian Manhunter. He's a real guy. <laughs> he can a real just, guy. <laughs> he can take the form of whatever he wants. So he could just, you know, immediately become Batman in, the, in that moment. And then, how right. do you prove it, you know? Right. Right. There's an explanation for everything. You're absolutely right in the world of DC. I guess or for, Marvel, for this so. question, we have to assume that it's proven. You assume that it's proven. You assume that he's come out maybe and admitted it, which I'm sure he has an alternative uh, universe. Right. So I guess the biggest but, question uh, is, is but, it the insanity defense? My parents were killed. I dress up as a bat and run around the city. <laughs> is that his defense? Absolutely. Not, not for civil liability. That's not going to, the lawsuits, that won't stop the lawsuits because it doesn't really matter if he's in, uh, civilly in, if he's insane, but it may matter if, uh, so if he's prosecuted for assault, but, uh, but no, not for civil liability. He's going to be on the hook. And really his, you know, insanity won't work because insanity requires showing that you either uh, didn't understand the nature and consequences, which means that you were swinging a baseball bat at a, what you thought was a baseball, and it turned out to be someone's head. That, that is a rarer example of insanity. But the broader example, as was expanded probably a, a several decades ago, includes not knowing that what you're doing is wrong. But it's not what you might think. 
it's whether it's not whether or not you personally think what you're doing is wrong. It's whether or not you're aware that society deems it wrong. So the minute you try to hide what you did uh, or ev- evade capture, then you've pretty much disproven insanity. If you want a, the insanity defense, you need to be like found with the body still talking to it or you know not understanding that you have to hide from the police. So it, Bruce Wayne probably doesn't have a good insanity defense no matter what. Even if he says, I thought I was a bat the entire time? <laughs> well, so the way what I would argue as a prosecutor is that now he does, you're, you know, your honor, he doesn't think he's a bat. Obviously, he doesn't cheap, cheap, cheap or try to fly with sonar. Uh, he <laughs> dresses up as a bat and he's made it very clear that he does that as a totem, as a as a symbol ah. to, you know, to scare criminals who are, as you know, Greg, a, quote, cowardly and superstitious lot, end quote. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And also, they probably the prosecutor would probably point out. And sir, as we all know, bats do not have eight pack abs. There's right. no reason why that would be or rubber on the nipples, suit. or rubber nipples. Uh, you know, Greg, I don't know about you, but you know, I'm I, I, in reading these comics, especially me. You know, I'm I'm getting to be middle, well into middle age now. It can be super depressing because even the accountants or like somebody selling a hot dog, they're all yoked. <laughs> but it might be are you reading like Rob Liefeld comics? It might be which comics you're reading exactly. Who's yoked? Nobody's got a gut. It's <laughs> it's super depressing. I mean, like it's even like you know, older folks like Commissioner Gordon. I mean, they're right. all they're all ripped. It, it's ridiculous. It, did you ever read the uh the Gotham Central um series that was yes. it, like the early late nineties, early two thousands? Um I think that's that's maybe the first series where I feel like they did sort of like pack on pounds for a couple of the cops where they were right. sort of like right. a little more ordinary than the normal, like got them CPD. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. But it gets, it gets out of control with some of these artists because yeah. they just make everybody from like the maintenance guy, the maintenance guy's yoked. It's, it's out of control. Right. Jim Lee loves drawing 42 muscles on each arm. Right. Right. And, exactly. And, and since we're talking about the, the intersection of uh, Batman and, and the police, I mean, it's when you have the bat signal, it's pretty obvious that the police are, you know, working with this guy. Sanctioning. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. They're, 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 you know, giving him, you know, carte blanche. What, uh, you know, what are they looking at? I mean, if there's, is there going to be a federal inquiry into the, what's going on in Gotham City? You know, it's, it's, you can almost equate it to the rioting because, you know, the rioting in real life right now is an example of citizens taking the law into their own hands. And Donald Trump has actually, threatened local mayors that, hey, if you don't get it under control, I'm sending in the feds. You know, it's, it's not certain to what degree uh, if, you know, the, the president does have federal authority to quell rebellion or send in the feds, so to speak. But, you know, to some degree, the law requires cooperation. I mean, he can send it in if the local authorities don't want it. But generally speaking, the law prefers that he works in conjunction with local authorities. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's interesting. If, uh, if the Gotham police are using a vigilante or allowing a vigilante to operate, and I guess the similar charge might be made by Trump that, you know, these mayors are allowing uh, vigilantes to run amok, uh, then, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess the feds could get involved. But the law doesn't, the, generally speaking, the states and local governments have the primary responsibility for policing their own citizens. The federal government is not supposed to be a police power. That's why you don't have traditional federal police in uniforms the way, you know, the way that, uh, you know, local police wear uniforms and they're called police. It's not, federal government isn't supposed to have the same thing because they're not the ones who are supposed to be in charge of keeping the order. And uh, and with with the, uh, the, the, what you brought up about uh, Donald Trump, uh, I think, what, what was he calling it? He was, he was trying to, um, call them uh uh what anarchist jurisdictions i think it was or something like that to to uh because of i guess um yeah in portland you have the um the presence of of antifa and we often hear that you know antifa isn't an organized group it's uh it's an idea and but you know when you watch like a lot of these you know a lot of videos it's like man there sure are a lot of people dressed the same way in black with like shields and stuff who happened to come together at the same time, almost like they sent out a memo and said, hey, be here at this time, and then we're going to go, um, you know, burn down some uh, some buildings. Uh, it is, 
is Antifa an organization? I mean, how do how do how does the government determine whether that they are or not? Yeah, that's a very tricky issue. And in fact, uh, the FBI does track what it calls loosely uh, organized criminal organizations. One example was probably, I think, uh, three, four years ago. It made it either to the Supreme Court or the court right below it, but it was the uh, fans of the Insane Clown Posse. I don't know if you remember hearing about this. It was probably in yeah. about 2014. The FBI classified them as a loosely knit criminal organization, which was really shocking to me because, I mean, they just seem like rabid fans. I don't know if they're any different than the Kiss Army or uh, people who like Guar or I don't know who else, but uh, mm-hmm. but I don't know what made them so different. But doing that, classifying them that way is a tool for law enforcement because once you've classified a group as a, who cares if they're loosely knit? I mean, as long as you classify them as a criminal organization, that's just one more check in your box when you need to get a search warrant or a wiretap or listen in on what they're doing. And so, you know, those are just little tiny bricks that, that keep building on the wall uh, of building cases against folks. And a, a big step was classifying them as a, a criminal organization. So, yeah, the FBI actually investigates this kind of thing and makes its own unilateral one-sided determinations that an organization is criminal. I bet, I bet Batman would be so confused if he went to a juggalo uh, rally because they look they're dressed like everyone he should be beating up. But exactly. Well, there's actually a ton of uh, yep. thugs that are dressed like jugglers, essentially in Gotham City. But if I can get to Batman real quick, that's right. That's true. So, that's true. <laughs> while, while you're here, I have to ask about uh, the Robins, right? So there's been five Robins. Yes. They've all become Robin yeah. between the ages of nine right. and sixteen. So real right. world prosecution. What is Bruce Wayne looking child at abuse. as far as child endangerment? Absolutely, absolutely, child abuse, and probably you could say for Jason Todd, probably murder. I mean. Probably murder in the sense that we talked about felony murder or earlier. I mean, he's engaged in a felony, uh, any number of felonies for a minor. I don't know how old Jason Todd was at the time of death. 14. I but think. Uh, 14. Okay. So, I mean, that's, you know, child endangerment resulting in death in some states. That could be a mur- murder charge if it's the qualifying felony. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the biggest uh, the biggest dings against Batman is his use of Robins. I mean, they are... Especially, I mean, including his own son. So uh, I think that 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 is categorically one of his main character flaws, right. and one that that is unquestionably criminal. I mean, you can talk about vigilantism. I mean, we accept vigilantism in the world of comics and fantasy. We like it because it allows us to live outside of the rules that we all are confined by. But in real life, we generally don't like vigilantes. We don't like people operating outside the law. But uh, but you know, even that is tough to suspend your uh, your reality, which is that, you know, he unquestionably endangers children. I mean, he, he is, he's a criminal that way. Yeah. A few years ago, I forget what series it was or what issue it was, or even who pointed out, but someone was talking to, I think it was Tim Drake Robin. Uh, and it was a girl, I forget who she was. And she was explaining, he lets you dress up in bright colors and hop around <laughs> while, while he fights. You're a distraction. So it's easier for him to do his job. Right. Like that's essentially how he right. uses all the robins. Why are they dressed in bright colors when he's in the dark? It doesn't really make sense. Sure, the targets. Yeah, right. I know it doesn't make any it's sense. It's easier for and, him you know, to do his job while you're looking at the little kid mm-hmm. hopping around in yellow and green. Right, right. It presumes something really nefarious about you know the people that uh, you're right. Exactly. He's just sort of his court jester. It's it's a uh, it's pretty uh, pretty bad stuff. I got to tell you. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, Greg, we're going to have to let uh, uh, Danny go, but um, y- you weren't here for the for the opening where uh, Danny uh, recounted uh, we were on a, a a different podcast together, and he, we talked about the uh, the birth of my son. And now I feel weird if he grows up to be a fan of Batman because I just see Batman as someone who just puts children in danger. So yeah, actually, his <laughs> the the current Robin is his son, is Batman's son, Damian Wayne. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. actually a very real thing that he's doing right now. Right. Do, you, do you think he's going to get killed in front of his son at some point? Is there going to be that like vicious circle? No, Damian. Well, Wayne nobody ever really dies before Batman. <laughs> Definitely, yes. <laughs> I think he's on the road. He's he's a bit of a loose cannon. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Danny, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Um, and uh, how can people uh, follow the work that you do? Uh, at uh, Savalas Laws Twitter, and uh, it's at C E V A L L O S 
uh, and law. And uh, that's it. And check out MSNBC and NBC News. And what's your comic awesome. blog? My <laughs> I, don't, I don't have one, unfortunately. Come on, I have to keep these you've got a pseudonym myself. that you write under. No, I wish. I wish. No, I, I keep these thoughts to myself because, frankly, Greg, as you probably know, you know, there are only so many folks you can tell tell this to that you're, you're a comic book fan. Lou looks at me weird every time I bring it up. <laughs>